K-State Athletic Director Gene Taylor joins us now, and uh, I guess we'll start with an overview of the entire athletic department because despite basketball coming just short, men's basketball that is of making the NCAA tournament this year, I think we saw kind of the solidification of all the probably top four or five sports in the forefront of people's minds. They have success and they have coaches that can do it. We saw it with baseball going to a super regional. Jeff Mitty obviously had a great year. Mm -hmm. What is your takeaway right now with not just the success of the programs, but the people that you have leading each individual program at K-State? Well, you know, the other sport I want to give a shout out to is volleyball, right? I mean, uh, he comes in and yeah. uh, obviously it was a new venue and you know, uh, takes us, we didn't get in the tournament, but we won a lot of really good yes. volleyball matches. Um, and I, you know, I appreciate, you know, what Jason's done in, in a one year time frame. Um, but I'm really, really proud of the coaches that we have and, and again, how they approach it and, and how they built their programs. Uh, they understand the culture of K-State. They understand the fan base. They understand, I think, what it takes in terms of the kind of athletes that we need to, to have be success here, have be successful here. Um, and you know, I, I you know, I, I, I look at Coach Mitty and the year that they had and the run. Uh, you know, that they got they got to host those you know games at, at home. They deserved it. Um, and I think about a Coach Mitty that you know, or uh, Coach uh, Hughes that missed last year. We all thought they should have gotten in. And then those players come back because they want to get one more run. And, and he's built that program. And he told us when we hired him, you know, this is my four or five year plan. And this is, you know, we're going to get to regionals. We're going to get to super regionals. And, and they did. And couldn't be more proud of, of how they've done it. And obviously, Coach Kleiman's been consistently successful, Coach Tang. So, you know, we've got other coaches as well. You know, we've got a Newman's golf coach who came in and had, had quite the year. And, you know, Grant's had a good year consistently. So, it's a lot of fun to see that success across the board. How much easier is your life when <laughs> you have coaches that are not just meeting expectations, but seemingly all of them are exceeding expectations? Well, I think the best part about it is they're really good people to work with, and they're easy to work with. And, yeah, they're demanding, and they, they want to push us as administrators to you know put them in the best light, the best opportunity to be successful, whether that's you know funding or, or facilities or – recruiting whatever the case may be um and i'd rather have that i, I want them pushing me and you know and you know sometimes like i'm gonna have to say no um but you know for us you know that's that's uh, that's our job is to support those coaches and and but the biggest thing is they're just really good people to come to work with every day and and I, we have great relationships with each other and i think we all trust each other and uh you don't want to do what's best for k-state we'll shift into football mode now you have 16 teams here it feels like a long day with eight <laughs> coaches going we'll have eight more tomorrow and everything uh what is the realignment process been like for you and now that we're kind of in this spot does this feel like we at least have another decade gap where things <laughs> might be settled down yeah i don't know if i'd go you know settle down you just never know you you know you hope we're at a point now that we can just settle into who we are as a as a group of four power four group you know if you'd have told me a year ago the pac-12 wasn't going to exist i'd have told you you're crazy um but so you know I, I think when i look at the landscape and i don't know everything um i think it's pretty stable uh, you know now when i say stable you, you know there's a lot of stuff going on in the acc right now and and you know does that become the next driver of a, of a major move i don't know um uh, you know certainly something that everybody keeps an eye on but i think as a conference of the big 12 we're in a great spot right now. I think we're in a position of strength. I think we've got a great conference that's going to have a lot of success. Um, and it's not just about some other conferences. I think it's we're clearly in that conversation. Uh, so something that Brett Yormark talked about was new TV windows. So what, what does that entail and what does that kind of look like? Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's a time slot necessarily. I think it's a, kind of the days more than anything because you have so many schools now and trying to fit games in in a position to – get exposure that you may see uh, you know some more third in terms of football perspective some more Thursday games you may see some basketball games now 
being played on Sundays and some of that conversation. I think we've just got so many teams that we are trying to get on, on, on you know, either prime spots or, you know, spots where we can get exposure that I think he's looking with our TV partners and saying, hey, how do we, you know, and, and I think the TV partners are doing the same because they've got to they've got to fill spots, but they can't fill them all on Saturday from, you know, 11 to 7 o'clock at night, so... You, you bring up the, the TV windows, and I, I was going to ask you about basketball because that's one that I thought about with does the Big 12 start to dance into some of those other time windows, and you seem to think that that could be a, a possibility. Do you think that the way that these new windows of you know games playing out, if they come to that, will they be given more to like, or would you push to have them given to, hey, these Pac-12 schools, they're used to playing on Sundays or at Eight thirty, nine o'clock at night, or how would you you go about using your voice in those conversations? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think uh, I think there are some schools that are that prefer some of the traditional. You know, you're not going to go to Arizona in, in September and October and play a, a noon game. You're just if you do, good luck. Uh, you're you're carrying half your team out. Um, but I, you know, I think. I think we have to make sure that they're, you know, if I'm a Pac-12 school, I'm like, oh, like I don't want to play seven o'clock every Saturday night, right? I mean, I, mm-hmm. you know, I do want some time, you know, I want some prime slots. So I think those are just conversations we have to have um, and continue to have. But I think at the end of the day, we just need to what's going to put the conference in the best foot forward and still get exposure on, you know, all the networks, whether it's ESPN, Fox, ESPN Plus, ESPN Two or U, whatever. Um, you know, you know, a lot of people thought that ESPN Plus was a bad place to be, but, you know, sometimes it's not necessarily the case because you can watch it on your laptop, mm-hmm. your phone, whatever, and and uh, you can kind of pick your, your game time, too. Uh, so you've been at K-State now for a while, and just so much has changed in college athletics in general and as a whole. So what, what do you think has been the hardest thing that you've kind of gone through in your time at K-State? You know, I think COVID really was was a, a major challenge. I think just the the mental drain of that, the unknown, you know, beyond just college athletics, you know, just you know families and and you know people not being able to work and the, you know the illness scared everybody and you know we were able to manage through it, but it, it put a lot of stress on a lot of people. You know, people were you know afraid to even come to work, right? Um, I think the gravity of all of that was just so different because it wasn't just an athletic thing. Like right now, we're dealing with the lawsuit and the settlement. Well, that's just that's just sports, right? Uh, nobody's going to get sick and not be able to recover from that. So when I you know I look back on my career, the, the COVID era is probably going to be one where you go, okay, I you know we were able as as administrators and coaches able to lead our athletes through that. Yeah, it wasn't easy, and yes, there's a lot of young people that were truly affected by that but you look back you go okay that's different than just deciding whether we're gonna pay an athlete or not or you know give them Austin money or not it's that was some real life stuff that we all had to go through uh, so looking forward to n- this next year what's some of your big goals for K-State's athletic department well I think you know part of it is is just figuring out this settlement and and how are we going to manage it as a department uh, and how are we going to make sure we stay competitive? And and then how do we explain to our donors and our fan base why we got here? And then what are we going to do moving forward? And then look at all the options that we need to look at from a ability to, to fund this thing, right? Uh, I, I you know people talk about private equity. Well, I think that's something we have to look at. We whether we do it or not, I don't know. But we just can't say shut the door on it. We have to look into it. Have to look and see what it means. Um, you know, you know, I'm not sure we're going to put patches on jerseys, but that's being talked about. Well, I know some people get uncomfortable with that. But you know what? If it brings in revenue, that's probably something we're going to have to do. Uh, so I think we really have to get our mindset outside of the comfort zone that we've known in college athletics and really start to think differently and really embrace some things that we maybe have not embraced before. When you talk about facing some of these challenges and everything that goes with it, this is Brett Yormark's third Big 12 Media Day since that that was announced that he was going to be the new commissioner. What has the relationship been like between him and all the other ADs in the league, and how important do you think he's been to making the Big 12 a viable option despite all the chaos, whether it's lawsuits or conference realignment and everything in between. Yeah. But Brett brings to the table, again, is just a, a new, fresh way of thinking. He didn't come from the, uh, the college athletics world, came from the professional world, it came from the revenue generation world. 
And so he's really forced us as uh, traditional ADs to think outside the box. You know, sometimes the conversations are sitting in the room going, what are you, what are you thinking about that? But he's been good, you know, and, and he, he was aggressive with, with the, the four corner schools to get them. He was aggressive with the TV deal. Um, he was aggressive, you know, bringing a halftime concert show to the football champ. People thought, you're crazy. Well, you know, but people watched it, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and so he's nonstop, and I think that's good for us right now, particularly in this era of, of looking at things differently. He's able to do that for us and bring – bring that mindset that you have to think outside the box and do something do things very differently than we've been doing for years you mentioned the four corner schools getting added uh, what what is your thought of their addition and the fit to the league i think the addition has been great i think they bring a lot uh, you know the fit's going to be unique because you've got some west west coast schools uh west coast being arizona and arizona state i guess they're really not west coast but they're western and you know, they play a kind of a little different brand of football in the Pac-12 they used to. Uh, you know, I think Utah probably and BYU play a more similar, you know, type of, uh, you know, game. Um, so we'll see. I, I, think they're, I think they bring good brands. I think they bring, obviously, really good, really good programs. I think their fan bases are going to be surprised when they come to a Big 12 stadium mm-hmm. in, in football. Uh, I guarantee you they've never probably had tortillas thrown at them yeah. uh, at Texas Tech. Um, and, and so I, I, th- I think the Arizona State coach was talking about, you know, last year they had to practice a silent count one time for a game, that now when they go on the Big 12 they're going to have to practice it on a regular mm-hmm. basis. I think that's a compliment to our fan bases um, and just the brand of Big 12 football is. Well, you mentioned uh, the concerts with Big 12 Championship and everything at halftime. Now, it made me think, I haven't ever gotten the chance to ask you this, but I've, I've always been fascinated by it. What was it like for you, because you were on the committee, not being able to be in AT&T Stadium for the 22 Big 12 Championship game? <laughs> well, when we won, it was brutal. Uh, <laughs> you know, when we were going through the actual game, I was able to sit in my room by myself and <laughs> You know, get frustrated if we did something not great and enjoy. I, I, I tell this story a million times that I scared the heck out of a poor <laughs> housekeeping person that was in my room cleaning because I didn't want to leave. And, you know, I think when Texas or when uh, TCU came down and scored late, I lost my mind there for a little bit. But um, I missed the be able to celebrate and, you know, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> hug Coach Kleiman and the players after the game. Um, I missed that part. Um, but it was, uh, you know, I would, I'd do it all over again if I was still on the committee and we were in the Big 12 championship. I'd, I'd sit in that room and watch it all over again. So it, it, you're, it, how much longer do you have on the committee or is your time up? I'm, I'm, I'm done. Okay. I, last year is my last year. You only get to do it for three years. Uh, it was a great, great experience. One of the best experiences I've had in my professional career. Uh, and it was about the people in the room. I mean, you go in there for seven weeks in a row and, all you talk about is college football. Yeah. And you don't worry about who's in the SEC or the Big Ten or the Big 12. You talk about we got to put in the best 25 best football programs, we think. And you just spend seven weeks watching and, and, and just talking about college football. I'll give you my last serious question, then, and I'll do it on the, the topic of the playoff. Expansion now is coming this year, 12 teams. And I, you know, you've seen various projections and stuff out there that it's only the Big 12 champ gets in or gets left out. Do you and the other ADs in this league share any concern that there will be that bias or that squeeze out of non-SEC or Big Ten schools? And how do you guys fight to make sure people recognize there's more than one good team in this league? Yeah, and I think, you know, I, I'll give you an example of when, you know, both us and TCU were in that championship game, right? Um, obviously, everybody felt that if TCU won that game, excuse me, <clears throat> if TCU won that game, they were getting in the Final Four. There was a lot of conversation about Kansas State. Not the fact we were going to be good enough to be in the Final Four, but we were a good football team. And now, I wasn't in the room, but I felt that when I came back in the room, the people were like, wow, you, got, you guys were talked about. When you get to play that, what are that, 13th game, right, and you've earned the fact of getting a champ game, that carries a lot of weight with the committee. And so they're going to look and say, okay, they just lost, let's say, you know, a team lost in the Big 12 championship. And yet this team didn't even play a championship. Uh, I'm going to give more weight to the team that earned that spot. Now, if they got in there and they were 6-5, and five, that's going to be a little different story. But if they get in there with a the record that we're talking about, um, because at the end of the day, the committee wants the best field of, of, of teams. And they don't, we don't look, I literally, when I'm at the end of the day and I'm looking at the screen, I don't really 
look at the teams and go, okay, we've got – eventually, yeah, you do. Like, okay, I got this many SEC. But you're going, okay, do, do I really believe the 10th team is better than the 11th team or the 12th team? I'm like, you know, I'm not sure. And I go back and revote and rethink about it. And that's all I worry about. I don't worry about – there is no logo of what that conference is. And if you make it to a champ game – and that's that another data point. And you, uh, 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 record-wise, deserve to be in there. You're going to get in there. I don't uh, worry about that at all. I'll switch gears a little to basketball now. Basketball is going to a 20-game conference slate. Are you in favor of that, or do you think that that's a little bit too much? Yeah, you know, I, uh, you know, the more I hear from the coaches, I'm <laughs> kind of leaning towards where they are. But and we did it because we lost the SEC Challenge, and I think our TV partners were, you know, they, they understand the value of the Big 12 in basketball. And they wanted those games, you know. I, I think Jamie Pollard, who served us on the, or I think still is on the big, uh, the Division One Basketball Selection Committee, he was worried about it a little bit because we already have a pretty good strength of schedule. So why add two more really tough games? Um, so I don't know that it'll last just one year, but I know the coaches will after this year will probably push to go back to eighteen and. Um, but we'll see. I, I think it's going to be great for the fans because you know we have a great group of teams coming in for basketball yes. from a home perspective. Um, but I, I think we have to be careful that we don't beat ourselves up to a point where uh, – but we're going to stick for it for a year, and then we'll reevaluate like we do kind of every year on, on those kind of decisions. Uh, so my first unserious question <laughs> is uh, – so we're in Las Vegas this week, obviously, and instead of Arlington, are you Vegas or Arlington? Well, for me, I mean, obviously Arlington was uh, an easy, you know, trip to get to, whether you flew commercially or not. Um, but, you know, I think Vegas is exciting. I, I'm not a big Vegas guy from a gambling perspective. I, I, lo- I love the excitement of Vegas and the hotels and the shows and just the bright lights and all that. Uh, you know, I, I think we have to be careful to, um, you know, not pigeonhole our hells, ourselves in because of the schools we have. I think we do have to think about getting out a little bit more. Um, but when you make a commitment to a, a, a group, whether it's at and Stadium or, or this stadium, I think they're going to want a little bit more than a one-year deal. So, um, But, you know, I, I, I think it's kind of fun. Yeah, I think it's I, – geographically, I think you guys are in a good position right now. Championship game for football in Texas. Yeah. Basketball in Kansas City, which it was great to see it stay there. And then, you know, give, give the, the schools out this way a little bit of a look. Uh, the last question that I wanted to ask you, because we've brought it up to everybody today, because it's one of the biggest topics in college football right now. Uh, will you be playing the EA Sports college football game, or have you gotten to any looks at that or any insight? No, on and here's why: K-State because back look? in the day when it was still around, and my son played, and he was about six years old and kicked my butt, I decided I wasn't very good then. I'm <laughs> probably not going to be very good now, so I'll just watch people play and and go. You know, I wish I could play that game. Uh, so my last question is: uh, better golf game right now between you, Coach Klein, and Coach Wells? Oh, uh, th- th- I'm not very good. I I'm a <laughs> I, I, I've not played with Wells yet. I've played with Kleiman. Kleiman is right down the middle, on the green, fringe of the green or on the green, par, maybe bogey. I'm over here. I'm over there. I scramble. I maybe get a bogey or double bogey. So I'm not in there. I'm not in their league right now. Feels like Coach Kleiman probably undersold his golf ability right now then based on what he told us earlier. Today, well, he hadn't so. probably hadn't played a lot. Yeah, that's what he said. So uh, he but, made it act like that was detrimental but when to his I've, game. When, but when he is playing, he's <laughs> he's not going to go to the, in, in, in the PGA Tour anytime soon. But he, he can – Champions he can, Tour maybe. He can stroke he's it. old he enough can, to be there now. He can stroke it. But I've not played with Wells, but I hear Wells. Mitty's pretty good. Uh, Pete plays a lot, but I've never played with, with Coach Hughes. Trying to think who else. Oh, oh, Jordan. Jordan mm-hmm. uh, is a good. He plays yeah. out golf quite a bit. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah. That by I've got a I've got a brother that works at Manhattan Country Club, and he's talked about Jordan's game a couple of times, yeah. and says that he's he's pretty solid. So I haven't played with him. So yeah. Awesome. Well, Gene, we appreciate the time. Thank you for having me. Appreciate yep, it, guys. Thanks. Good to see you.